art is the reshaping of reality by man to present it in an understandable way. As the artist recreates the world around him, it is shaped by how he sees it and what he believes in. The Indian artist did not attempt to depict only the material reality around him. He wished to share the complete experience of the moment, not just the photographic presentation of the shapes around him. Beauty for the Indian artist has been a reflection of the glory of God. In fact, for the ancient artist, the experience of beauty, the ecstasy on seeing nature or art which is truly beautiful, has been considered as akin to Brahmanand or the final bliss. Join us on this journey into the heart of the Indian tradition of painting. Come with us to the gorge of the Vaghora River where Ajanta was created, to the courts of the Mughals and the Deccani Sultans. Journey with us through the deserts of Rajasthan and the icy lands of Ladakh and Lahore Spiti, in the verdant south and in the gentle hills of the north, experience the compassionate view of life that is enshrined in Indian painting. In the philosophy of India, the world that we see around us is considered to be mithya or an illusion. Since ancient times, the purpose of the Indian artist was to give us a glimpse of that which is more important, the life of the spirit, the life within. The art of India presented a view of the underlying harmony of all of creation and took us always away from the concerns of the material world. India was a great trading nation, famed far and wide and had a rich cosmopolitan culture. Indian artists assimilated the different influences which came over the ages from China, Greece, Persia and other places. The tradition of art in India was a strong and living force which continuously evolved over the centuries. However, in the 18th and 19th centuries, this tradition was fractured. I think after the colonial encounter, there is clearly a rupture in that uh, continuity. And I think it's the consequences of that rupture that Indian art has had to uh, tackle and work around in the last hundred years. There was this wonderful balance between the uh, social needs of uh, the painting as well as individual expressions. This wonderful balance, I think, got disrupted uh, ever since uh, the colonial period where the old ateliers were broken but the new forms that came into being were not, uh, did not have a historical past. So willy-nilly the individual painter was in a limbo. On the one hand he didn't have a system by which to formulate his ideas and his uh, forms. And on the other hand, as an individual, although he felt a strong need to express himself, at the same time he was uprooted because there wasn't a past or a tradition to go by. The 18th and 19th centuries brought fundamental changes in the political, economic and social life of India. European dominance was established in all aspects of life. Vastly different influences of culture and art came from faraway shores and new examples were set to be emulated by the Indian people. The British wished to have endless drawings and representations of India to take back home with them. 
They wanted to understand the culture and traditions of the people whom they now ruled. Drawings were found to be a very important tool to capture the culture and ways of the richly diverse people of India. For the making of vast numbers of drawings, paintings and prints, European artists took on Indian apprentices and assistants. They found what they considered to be basic flaws in the Indian ways of painting and drawing. Along with other educational institutions, art schools were set up to teach Indian artists the Western manner of painting. The style of academic realism of Western art became a norm to be appreciated and emulated in India. Princely states still existed, but as subordinates to the new foreign rulers. This was the context in which Raja Ravi Varma emerged in the field of art. He was born in 1848 and was related to the royal family of Travancore. One normally begins the story of modern Indian art with the history of Abhinindranath Tagore and the movement he began, which later came to be called the Bengal School. But I think there's a case for also looking back further, you know, further backwards, say, to the middle years of the 19th century, to the beginnings, say, of the first art schools in India, because I think a new social and professional category of art and artists is really born in that period. So uh, what I think is important to also take into consideration that there is a new group of middle class professional artists, very different from earlier craftsmen and artisans, who come into the picture and who initially are really uh, practitioners of oil painting, a certain kind of academic realism, but who do command the scene of that period. And of course, one has in mind a figure like Raja Ravi Varma in the South, who does become a figure of national importance. Uh, what is equally important to remember is that many of these first academic Western style artists, so to quote, are equally involved in trying to build a category which they consider is a national art for modern India. So they're interested in working on Indian themes, specifically cultivating a new kind of taste for art among an Indian art public. The work of Raja Ravi Varma became immensely popular. He was an Indian who had mastered the Western style of academic realism in painting. He painted grand portraits of members of Indian royal families. What made him extremely successful were his paintings depicting themes from the great Indian epics, the Ramayana and Mahabharat, and from traditional Sanskrit literature. Well, essentially, Ravi Varma's importance came from using the Western academic style and bringing in the Indian theme rooted in its myth, in its mythology, its um, religious aspects, um, its sense of color, its sense of dress, its sense of um, ritual, its um, stories from the Ramayana, from the Mahabharat, from um, other kind of um, stories of, um, which already had a root in the Indian ethos. But the style was totally alien. The genre he created found immediate acceptance and popularity with the people. Here was someone who exhibited all the technical mastery over the style, which was in vogue and immensely admired. He also brought to the people their myths and stories, gods and goddesses, all garbed in highly realistic human forms. We see in these paintings dramatic scenes where the characters appear to be playing out theatrical roles. He is working within a colonial uh, period. He is also trying to make his own place within the colonial regime. He is not in, a, in actual fact a victim or a servant of that context. He is actually making major transformations through a new medium that he has learnt of his own will 
and through a degree of symbiosis with what he understands European painting to be, but which he has the intelligence and the skill to be able to make into an, uh, uh, an um, idiom appropriate to the late 19th century in where major historical changes are taking place. Raja Ravi Varma also began to make prints of his paintings. This made his work available to larger numbers of people. In the meantime, government art schools had been set up in major Indian cities. The hub of artistic activity in Bombay was the JJ School of Art, headed by John Griffiths. Griffiths and his students undertook a major project of painting reproductions of the Ajanta murals over a period of 12 years from 1872 to 1884. They were greatly inspired by the magnificent tradition of ancient Indian painting. In reaction to Ravi Varma and the kind of school that he um, propagated, the Bengal school, or um, as people would say, that which was started by um, Abhindranath Tagore, Kumava Swami, Havel, together, um, in which they went back to the Indian miniatures, Mughal miniatures, Bahari miniatures, to Ajanta, um, taking their um, inspiration from Indian traditional art and deriving a new style, which again had the myth and religious themes as the substance of the uh, painting, but the use of the line, um, a different use of color, a different sense of perspective, which again is Ravi Varma. In 1919, Ajanta was once again a place of pilgrimage for artists. Lady Herringham took three artists from Calcutta to paint reproductions of the Ajanta murals. They were all students of Abhinindranath Tagore, Nandlal Bose, Asit Haldar and Samarendra Gupta. For painters who up till then had not known of the existence of a highly developed tradition of painting in India, this journey to Ajanta was an exhilarating experience. The Bengal school, headed by Abhinindranath Tagore, tried to formulate a new national aesthetic, which was based upon the styles of ancient and medieval Indian paintings. This was a complete change from the Western academic style of painting which was being taught in art schools. Um, there is an, a way in which the new art movement completely rejects this academic past uh, and purely labels it as something derivative, colonial and something which is not of any aesthetic merit. What uh, Abhinindranath and his, the first phase of students were trying to do was to really rebuild a new nationalist art, but still largely uh, concerned with ways in which to break out of the Western academic mold and build what they considered an idealistic spiritual art. With Abhinindranath's movement, there's an equal emphasis on building an artistic collective because he does want to build a school. He feels that the project of a new national art cannot be achieved by a single person. It requires a whole movement, it requires a following. I think that becomes a kind of paradox that the success of the movement relied so much on the dissemination of a certain stereotype of what was then uh, kind of highly kind of applauded as this is true Indian art. But that also becomes the main weakness of the movement, that it becomes repetitive, it becomes very formulaic. And in the later history of modern Indian art, we find that those we consider the new modern masters would consciously break away from the collective. In 1902, the great poet Rabindranath Tagore established the Vishwa Bharati University at Shantiniketan near Calcutta. He disagreed with the direction 
that the nationalist art movement was taking in copying the styles of the past. In his vision, true modernity in art was to be rooted in the living spirit of the people and the times. In 1919, he invited the artist Nandlal Bose to head the Kalabhavan, an art institution which he set up in Shantiniketan. No, Shantiniketan, uh, when the Kalabhavan is set up in 1920, it does represent a major break within the nationalist art movement. In fact, it's Rabindranath's own dissatisfaction with the very closeted and hothouse nature of Indian style painting as it came up in the Jorasako household, which propels him to set up this new art center. And its prime concern is to reintegrate art with nature, with everyday life, and particularly, as he says, with living folk and rural traditions. And I think that does signal a major shift within the modern art movement, where Indian art moves away from its ancient classical sources, or purely away from its medieval courtly traditions, and begins to look at art at a more everyday level. So this is the living tradition around them. By the time we come to the 20s, I think there's less talk about transcendentalism and idealism and more talk about invigorating Indian art, bringing it, you know, the spirit of living India. And the living India was really village India, which they discovered around them. Rabindranath's own art can be called truly modern. It stands apart from any particular school or rigid ideology. He formulates his own idiom that is informed by a constant and honest search for an identity which is both intensely local and yet universal. Shanti Niketan and Rabindranath's vision laid the foundations for some of the finest endeavors to find a true artistic expression in the midst of the changing times. Artists who studied and taught at Shantiniketan constantly broke new ground, attempting to devise an expression that drew inspiration from the ancient traditions of India without copying them. One offshoot of the Bengal school to some extent was um, Nanlal Bose, one of the uh, finest artists um, of uh, modern India, who first started as a student of Abhindranath Tagore, then when Abhindranath asked him to join him at Shantinaketan, a whole new um, openness of views came to him, where the countryside, the rural um, daily life of the artisan, the craftsperson, became a more natural inspiration along with the nature. And I think Nandalal is really at the forefront of this attempt to reintegrate a modern artist sensibility with these folk traditions. And I think one major point of this merger comes about in the 30s, when he's called on by Gandhi to decorate the panels of the Haripura Congress. This is in 1938. Nandalal's Haripura uh, Congress posters, they do represent a time when the modern artist is able to fully impersonate a folk style. And it's extremely important because he's using the most simple of materials. He's using a series of characters which are drawn from everyday village life, musicians, trades and castes, village gods. And he's using the style of the Urisha Potochitra. And together he packages it in a way that it is still unmistakably the hand of Nandalal Bose. But it represents now a new modern art which can signify uh, uh, the people's traditions. This was an exciting period in Indian art and indeed in Indian history. Indian artists were rejecting the yoke of the West and attempting to rediscover their own roots. They wished to forge a new modern identity based upon these roots. Jamni Roy's importance um, is pivotal in the sense of he was probably one of the first modern Indian artists who decided to go back to the folk and tribal traditions of Indian art. Um, use the colour 
and the line use of, let's say, the Kalikats or um, even the folk traditions to evolve the idiom totally his own. And this was best represented by eventually his work of the 1940s in which he took even a theme so alien as study of the Bible or um, themes based on Christianity to which he did not feel a, national, um, a natural emotional empathy but he realized that if his style could um, represent themes of such nature, he had truly developed a new style. Along with Jamni Roy, there was um, Gagindanath Tagore, who to some extent was um, a very individualistic artist, a man who followed no group, no school, no movement, um, a true connoisseur of the arts, and a man who genuinely um, supported and nurtured many artists. Gagindanath in many ways um, started uh, a look into the West as a source of inspiration to some extent. Um, in the 19, early 1920s, him along with Rabindranath Tagore brought the German Expressionists, a um, very large exhibition of woodcuts, and that inspired many people to look at Cubism, which was a very important movement in the world at that time, but to India, it had not come so early. Amrita Shergil was born in 1913 to a Hungarian mother and sick father. She trained at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris and returned to India in 1934 in search of her roots. On her return to India, she attempted to integrate the two manners of perception and aesthetics which she had inherited. By the 1940s, early 1940s, um, a whole new interest in European modernism had emerged. And a pivotal um, player in that whole process was Amita Shegel. Being um, open to the West, she brought in a kind of um, post-impressionist um, sense of color, form, which was very new for India. And in the late 1930s, um, she became quite an icon figure and inspired many artists to um, re-study the use of colour in given structure to Indian modern art. In the words of art historian Dr. Mulkraj Anand, she had seen the Indian people from the point of view of an outsider who wanted to become an insider. Amrita travelled extensively in India and rediscovered the rich legacy of India's ancient and medieval artistic traditions. And Ajanta is part of her itinerary when she goes visits them. She visits the South Indian temples, the mural paintings. And if for her it's a whole new rediscovery. She's coming out of an academic training and a modernist background and she's out to rediscover a new Indian lineage. And Ajanta to her becomes also the symbol of the grandeur and the greatness of India's artistic past as against what she considered the mediocrity of the present. The nothing she saw around her inspired her as much as some of these great traditions, say the miniatures and Ajanta would. And there's a distinct way in which she tries to again work out her own visual codes drawing on the colours, the stylizations, the physiognomy of the Ajanta figures. And I think in the late 30s this represents another very critical moment when Ajanta becomes very central in defining a lineage for the modern Indian artist. Amrita wrote, I am an individualist, evolving a new technique which though not necessarily Indian in the traditional sense of the word, will yet be fundamentally Indian in spirit. With the eternal significance of form and colour, I interpret India, and principally the life of the Indian poor, on the plane that transcends that of mere sentimental interest. She was uh, already uh, in Paris connected with uh, 
uh, a view that could be called a kind of new humanism, uh, a realism that developed between the two world wars. And uh, coming with that kind of, uh, of view, uh, she encountered India uh, with uh, both an element of a kind of uh, nostalgia, because she had lived here before, of trying to uh, represent uh, the people. Amrita Shergill was amongst the earliest artists who explored the possibility of an interaction and synthesis between Western and Indian artistic traditions. From the 1920s, new strands began to appear in the tapestry of Indian art. Against the backdrop of India's ancient artistic legacy and the changing times, the Indian artist attempted to evolve his personal vision. A new national cultural identity was being forged, one that was not based on the slavish imitation of past traditions, nor on Western norms, but one which derived sustenance and inspiration from a great legacy and looked forward dynamically into the future.